All right. Well, thank you very much for everyone who's joining us uh, for our virtual talk tonight. Um, my name is Dana Thorne, and I'm the Curator Supervisor at Lampton Heritage Museum, and I'm going to be your moderator. Um, I'm just going to take a, a bit of time to go over kind of the Zoom presentation, what you can expect tonight, and then I will um, introduce our speakers and we can learn a little bit about uh, pollinators. So uh, please feel free to use the, the chat box um, if you want to interact with uh, other attendees or if you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers. Uh, you can also use the Q&A function to submit any of your questions. Um, I will hold the questions until each speaker has finished presenting. And then uh, once they're done, I will present those, um, those questions to them and also give you another chance if you had any other um, questions that, uh, that popped up in your mind, um, there'll be a chance to address them then. And I will be recording tonight's presentation as well. So um, if you want to watch it again or you want to share it with friends and family, I will be emailing out a recording of the presentation um, to everyone who was registered tonight. So thanks again for being with us. I'm uh, gonna open just by sharing a little bit about Lampton Heritage Museum. So we are the uh, institution that's uh, hosting this virtual talk tonight. We are located um, just south of Grand Bend, uh, across from Pine Ridge Provincial Park. So kind of, yeah, right there in a very beautiful location close to Lake Huron. And uh, we have a variety of different kinds of artifacts on display at the museum um, since we are Collection is focused on the history of Lambton County specifically. We have a lot of artifacts related to our agricultural history, but a lot of interesting things documenting our, um, our social history and um, history of uh, local, local businesses and local families as well. And we have a series of historic buildings um, on our site. These buildings were brought to the museum from other parts of Lambton County. We have a uh, slaughterhouse, a blacksmith shop, a church, a schoolhouse, and a little um, pioneer cabin as well. These can all be explored on the grounds at Lambton Heritage Museum. And uh, one great event that the Heritage Museum has coming up is our Fall Color and Craft Festival. Uh, this will be 30th or 31st year that we've been doing this annual event. Um, very popular, we're so glad that we could do it following uh, COVID, COVID protocols with uh, the restrictions that are in place this year. So you can join us October 16th and 17th for the Lambton Fall Color and Craft Festival. Well, thank you very much for um, listening to a little bit about the Heritage Museum. And I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. So tonight our focus is on pollinators. I know pollinators aren't always very popular. Um, I know my five-year-old daughter always goes into a complete panic anytime that she sees a bee and starts running away and shrieking. But these uh, creatures are actually a really important part of our healthy ecosystem. We're going to learn tonight about why they're so important. And our first speaker is James uh, Corcoran with the Ministry of Transportation. He's a general services coordinator who specializes in vegetation, and he's going to share with us about his work in installing and promoting pollinator corridors tonight. So thanks for being with us, James. You can uh, share your screen. Oh, and you're still on mute. Thank you, Dana. How are we doing? Can we see my screen? Absolutely. Terrific. So the presentation is divided into three basic parts here. The types of plants used for highways, the advantages of tall grass prairie when used on highways, and the challenges that um, we're facing, I'm facing both internally and externally with implementing this change to, to tall grass prairie. So common lawn grass um, consists of Kentucky bluegrass, fescues, and perennial ryegrass. Any bag of grass that you pick up for your lawn is probably gonna have these three components in it, and, and that's usually just about all, or variations of them. These are non-native agronomic grasses, um, plants from, from Europe. Um, they're terrific for playing soccer on, um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, MTO standard roadside mix, which has been used for 40 plus years, is exactly the same thing. So it has a, these grasses, when used in a non-maintenance environment, they have a number of problems because they do require frequent mowing, weeding, fertilizing, watering, and they're prone to flooding. So you know what would happen if you walked away from your lawn, right? It would be a big weedy mess. 
And that's what's happening to Ontario's roadsides. Uh, one of the biggest problems is this in invasive Phragmites. And right now there's an Ontario-wide effort to, to eliminate it that's primarily based on spraying herbicides. Um, it's The picture on the right is Port Franks, uh, where it's invaded into the wetlands on Utter Drive and uh, it's being pulled out with a special machine uh, from Europe um, that, you know, it, it's very costly and expensive. It's invaded you know, the lakeshore from uh, Kettle and Stony Point all the way through to Port Franks. It's threatening Georgian Bay wetland. It's, and it's invaded uh, Long, Long Point. Uh, the helicopter spraying on the, on the left kind of sim, uh, is a, is a uh, note of what's uh, happening there to try and deal with it. Um, so that's just one invasive plant uh, of, of many, um, probably 20 or more, that can easily invade these agronomic grasses. And the other problem that these grasses have is, is that they don't deal very well with a lot of rainfall. They don't absorb moisture, they don't hold it, and they don't, um, and they, and they don't use it as well as, uh, as tall prairie grass. So now I'm, I'm gonna go through with you uh, a seed mixture that we've put together uh, a lot of work uh, by myself and by a lot of co-op students uh, from various universities that have that have helped me, and we put together and 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 also people in the people in the industry such as Ian who's going to be speaking later, and we so we put together a mixture that that works for roadsides in that it's it's available um, off the shelf basically uh, you you yourselves can buy mixtures or similar to it from some of the some of the seed companies. Um, and it has five different species of grass in it, and it has 12 different species of pollinator plants or flowering plants in it. I'm going to go through just a few of them and explain why they work really well for roadsides and deal with some of these problems like invasive plants and like flooding. And um, I think you can also see at the same time how they may be something you might want to consider using in your own landscapes. So the first one, big blue stem, um, it's also called turkey foot. And I know when I walk behind my place here and into the pinery, there's a big stand of it. And I see it when I ride the bicycle path between uh, the pinery and Grand Bend that it's starting to come into areas where uh, people don't mow the right of way, right? It's starting to, to move into there as well. It's four to eight feet tall and has an equally deep root system, which adds organic matter deep into the soil that means less flooding and erosion because all of this organic matter is really good at holding water. And it prevents invasions by tall invasive weeds like Phragmites, and it shades out other invasive plants and weeds like Canada thistle. And uh, one, one thing that we always get asked internally when I promote the use of these grasses is, well, what about deer? Isn't it, aren't deer gonna love this, these things? But the, the reality is that bison like it, but deer don't eat it. So another one that you'll find there's a lot, it's become very popular, another native grass that's a companion plant to big blue stem is little blue stem. It's easy care, unfussy, and you know, quite beautiful. It establishes on disturbed sites and poor soils, including compacted clays. And it's a fast grower, and it has a deep root, fibrous root system, five or more feet deep, which also means good erosion control and flood control and it's not a preferred food by deer, um, which is important for roadsides. Another grass in, in the mix that we're promoting is Indian grass. It's called Indian grass. I'm just using common names here, but uh, it's, it's three to six feet tall. It also is not a preferred food for deer. And one of the really cool things about it for highways is that it stays low most of the year and then it bolts and gets taller at the end of the growing season. So by staying low, it's not a problem, say for sight lines when you're coming in and out of driveways or around curves on a road, but when it bolts early in the fall, then it makes a perfect um, plant for catching blowing snow. And I'll show you a little bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. So there's a couple more grasses, but uh, we'll skip in now over into the flowering plants that are in this mixture for roadsides. Uh, smooth oxeye, smooth oxeye, also called false sunflower. 
Uh, this is a three to foot tall plant. It's a tough plant and it's recommended again for clay soils or sand and it blooms for three months. So, uh, you know, adds some beauty to the roadsides and it's deer and drought resistant again. Um, another one, swamp milkweed. This is an important plant because we need, we need plants that work well in wetter sites because we're dealing, you know, a lot of roadsides are wet, of course. And it also blooms for four weeks, deer and rabbit resistant again. Blue vervain uh, prefers fertile loam, wet muck soils, tolerates standing water. There's quite a lot of this uh, on the right, right of way already, but it's also in the mix that we're adding. And um, because it's good in standing water, makes it a nice competitive plant also to deal with eradicating invasive Phragmites, something that will occupy the same space that Phragmites might otherwise occupy. Virginia Mountain Mint, it's an aggressive spreader uh, in wet soils, which means also it can also help uh, fight invasive species like the Phragmites. Wild bergamot, also called bee balm. You'll see a lot of this around here naturally occurring in the pinery. Uh, it thrives in, in all soils. Again, highly deer resistant. Black eyed Susan um, has high drought tolerance for when we get into, you know, and of course roadsides aren't watered, so that's important. Um, it needs acidic soils, by the way. It's aggressive of given space, which is great. That's a great thing when it comes to roadsides because whenever there's holes or openings that, that naturally occur, you want something to fill them in as quickly as possible, just naturally. Again, it's highly resistant to deer. This picture, White Heath, was taken today on Highway 21 at my highway. And um, if, if I was able to zoom in on it, um, I could show you right in the middle of it that black spot is a great big bumblebee and on the left more bees and it was just full of pollinator bees today. It withstands drought and it provides this nice bloom in the fall and you'll see a lot of it as you're driving around. Um, interesting story about my drive, my roadside here, which is Highway 21. My good intention neighbor just a few weeks ago came across the road and asked me if I'd like him to mow to mow this, to mow the right away in front of my house, which which is kind of humorous because, um, you know, I I fight, you know, the whole idea of mowing the right of way so we can protect our pollinators, have these plants for them and have all the other benefits we're talking about in terms of erosion control and diversity. So we had a we had a good talk. Um, but uh, but there you go, even even in my very own neighborhood, um, I have to, you know, even if I don't mow my lawn I, or the, the roadside, I, I have to make sure my neighbors don't do it for me. So a little bit about what we have done so far with this on a, on a larger scale. Highway 40 from Wallaceburg to Sarnia was seeded to prairie grass by the by escape uh, who Ian will represent and will be speaking here a little later. So they seeded it as early as 2005. So this is our first broad scale, I guess you'd say operational use of tall prairie grass on a highway. And it is doing all of these things that we talked about marvelously in terms of keeping out invasive species like Phragmites and some other very in cool stuff. For example, Here's a shot in the winter driving this section of Highway 40 uh, where, the, where the prairie grass has been planted during, it's not snowing, but snow is blowing across farm fields. And you can see the highway here is nice and clear. Um, and as, 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 the, uh, as the car is driven a little bit further within minutes and crosses over to where the prairie grass stops and traditional roadside grasses are planted, MTO standard roadside mix. This is what you see. And this was just like a, just like crossing a line where between the prairie grass and the, and not prairie grass. So point is because it's a tall structure, it's really good at holding blowing snow on the highways. So consequently, we've been able to convince um, folks 
to, to bring it uh, anywhere where we have blowing snow problems. And coincidentally, we, we are seeding it, well, virtually right now on Highway 21 between the 402 and Forest, because if you drive down through there, um, large open fields to the west, blowing snow all the time. And I'll tell you something about blowing snow is that we know that blowing, it's, it's blowing snow that causes most of the icing on the highways, which means not when it's snowing, but for a 24 hour period after it stops snowing, but we have large over cleared landscapes here and snow continues to blow. And that's what makes that ice sheet on the highway that you don't expect because it's not snowing. And, um, that's the reason why we want windbreaks and tall prairie grass can act as a windbreak. So it's all, we're also seeding it in select locations uh, between Kettle and Kettle Point and Grand Bend, uh, right through the highway construction area that received the paved shoulders recently. So we're also doing that right now. And, and this picture here is, uh, is taken um, in, this, in this area, with, I would say within a kilometer of the museum um, last year, and we already have some nice native plants in there like butterfly milkweed and, and um, dark-eyed Susan and, and, and others. And so we're going to be adding more and, and that means that you know, the, the seeds will move around and keep the right-of-way, um, you know, looking, keep the right-of-way in a natural state and uh, which is good for pollinators. So the challenges you know, internally, one of the biggest challenges is the mower. And uh, we get, we get, all it takes is one or two public inquiries about weeds. And it's very easy for folks to apply, you know, to apply it, the solution, which is brute force, let's go out and mow. And, and uh, that's, that's, um, that's a problem because it attacks pollinators. Um, it's actually in the long run spreads more weeds around because they the, the seeds land on the mowers and they get spread down the highways and uh, you know defeats the purpose of, of having all of the environmental benefits and drainage benefits of having a taller structure on the right of way. So we have we have challenges internally with reducing the amount of mowing and promoting prairie grasses and have the same problem externally. Uh, I know as you, as you drive on the highways, you'll see a lot of property owners have taken it upon themselves to mow not only in front of their, their homes, which you, you can understand why they might want to do that, but larger property owners seem to be happy to mow kilometers and kilometers of the highway, uh, Highway 21, Highway 4. And so that's another one of the problems that we have is that People, people like to see the road, the, the grass mowed right to the nub in front of their houses. It, you know, and it, it's just ingrained in, in practice and in belief that that's the state that things should be. One of the other, uh, one of the folks that, that works with me at MTO had an explanation for it. He said that, one explanation for it, he said that, you know, that his father told him that when the banker was coming to your farm to uh, look at, you know, to, to talk to you about refinancing. One of the things you, you had to do was make sure you had everything mowed up and tidy, looking clean, because that meant you were a good farmer, right? And, and so these, these, these mindsets are ingrained in, in, in people and, and it just, just continues and, and it's a, an education process, but um, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's very frustrating. And, um, and you can imagine what, what happens to these pollinators when, when these roadsides are mowed at the wrong time, it takes away their food, uh, you know, takes away their habitat. So this is, this slide is, is my last slide and it's just a summary of, of the, all of the benefits that we talked about, how the deep roots um, uh, and the above ground foliage reduce stormwater runoff and the organic matter that's introduced to the soil acts like a sponge and absorbs way more moisture than a, a regular turf grass. And the, they shade out invasive species and having the mixtures that we're developing that have 
you know, upwards of 20 species in them compared to three or four species in a standard um, a European uh, mixture of turf soils. Well, having all of these species means that we can, you know, have a tighter, a tighter growth that fills in all of the holes and gaps and keeps out invasive species. So, um, for, for folks that are interested in seeing us continue uh, working towards having uh, native grasses. And, and, and I would say that in Ontario, we are far behind other jurisdictions like the, the states immediately to the south of us in terms of implementing, implementing as a policy. Um, even uh, the latest US infrastructure bill um, includes not only money for pavement, but money for converting rights of ways in the United States, at least, to tall grass prairie. But uh, here in Ontario and in Canada, we're, we're, we're really far behind. So one thing that you can do um, is, if you feel so inclined, is, is write to your MPP or to the Ministry of Transportation or phone or go on the website and ask why you're not seeing tall grass prairie on the, on the roadsides. Uh, you could do the same thing at the county level, for that matter. And uh, why why are the roadsides being mowed? Um, you know, et cetera. Like, in the words of um, Cindy Blackstock, you know, governments don't create change; they respond respond to change. So, which means they respond to public opinion. And uh, I couldn't agree any 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 more. So. Um, that is uh, my request, if you're so inclined. And um, thank you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, James. Yeah, it must be hard to kind of get that um, societal shift in how people think that the, uh, the roadway should look. Um, could you stop sharing your, your slides there? Perfect. I can do that. Okay. Well, I, uh, I didn't see any questions, but if you have any um, questions for James, you can pop them in the Q&A or in the chat. Our uh, next speaker tonight is Ian Cameron. Ian started working with the Rural Lambton Stewardship Network in 2002 as a habitat restoration technician. Since then, the organization has changed from a government entity with the Ministry of Natural Resources into a not-for-profit incorporation, which uses the name Ontario Nativescape for their habitat creation and restoration projects. Some of the things Ian does in a given week includes project planning, working on a tractor, planting native tall grass prairie habitat, creating customized seed mixes for projects, and managing Ontario Nativescape seed production sites. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the work of Ontario Nativescape and uh, what you do tonight. Ian, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I certainly believe that I may have just one of the coolest jobs out there. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on the basics of Tallgrass Prairie. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do and a little bit in terms of establishment as well. Um, feel free. I'm more than happy to field questions at the end. So if you have any good questions, uh, feel free to think them up. I'm just going to share my screen. So there'll be a shift for a second here. There we go. Okay, I'm not really too sure how much everybody knows about Tallgrass Prairie. So I'm, you know, I'm going to keep this fairly brief, but I'm going to start kind of at the beginning. Um, first off, you know, I, I'm a habitat technician. Um, I, we, with Ontario Nativescape, we're a division of Rural Lambton Stewardship Network, which is our legal entity. And uh, we started as a pilot project in 94 with the Ministry of Natural Resources, which kicked off the entire Ontario Stewardship Program, which is not the Ontario Stewardship Battery Program. It's the one designed to uh, set up a stewardship network for every county of Ontario, where you'd have an MNR employee that would guide your council of individuals to do whatever kind of projects you really wanted to. We set ours up on, on the, for on the ground restoration work. Uh, the MNR dissolved it in 2013, and in 2013 we incorporated it as a not-for-profit, and we uh, set up shop in Wallsburg. Um, like I said, I'm here to talk about Tallgrass Prairie, but when a lot of people think about, you know, outside, out in the country, um, you know, a lot of people think, you know, this is, you know, it's Ontario, there's big trees, there's, you know, expanses of wilderness, but where a lot of these trees 
did you know weren't like along coastlines and a lot of wetter areas there were a lot of native species and i've also got a historical record of tall grass prairie found in chatham kent uh, in 1790 there was a mcniff uh, survey showing and also the rankin survey of 1847 which actually mapped out where a lot of these tall grass prairies were a lot on the coast of lake st Clair as well following up the uh, essentially the entire corridor of the uh, of uh, the St. Clair River. So there really were a lot of large wet areas uh, which would have prairie in them versus just tree stands. So when you think of the outdoors, you know, think of a lot, a lot other than trees, a lot of native species. And there still are large remnants of tall grass prairie. This was a photo from Walpole Island. And uh, as James had kind of stated along 21 Highway, you see a lot of remnant pieces. You go to Pinery, you see a lot of remnant pieces. There's still a lot of it out there, but uh, it's, you know, a lot of the reason why there's so little of it is because they were eat grounds that were easy to clear. So a lot of the prairies became the farm fields of today. So that's kind of, and you know, they are less competitive as a lot of uh, other invasive weeds and cool season grasses. So that's kind of why they've all disappeared today. It's simple, it's a mixture of native warm season grasses and wildflowers. And they estimated that about 100,000 hectares of Southern Ontario was actually covered in prairie. And less than 1% of the original tall grass prairies that once thrived in Midwestern US and Canada still remain today. Um, you know, if you're ever planning a trip, you can head off to Chicago and a lot of these native prairies are still in existence. Um, one of the big components of prairie is warm season grasses. Um, they're really adapted to our climate and uh, they offer a lot of cover, as James mentioned. Um, like you've got these great big tall grasses, but they're all bunch grasses. So down below on the ground, you've got a lot of bare ground that wildlife can move through. And uh, also when, when it snows in the winter, all the grass kind of flops down and creates a uh, good uh, winter habitat for, uh, for a lot of species. Um, I've been out in production area, in our production area where we grow grasses and I've, near, I've nearly stepped on a deer because they feel so comfortable bedding down in it. It uh, I yelled a little bit. And the grasses are really deep rooting. Uh, warm season grasses generally have about a nine foot deep root system, uh, which does outcompete uh, a lot of noxious weeds. They, present, they prevent soil erosion um, just because you've got so much material above and you've also got the uh, deep, deep rooting, uh, all the deep roots. Um, so this is a comparative shot of big blue stem and you know what your cool season grasses would be like. Uh, the other component is all wildflowers. Um, they support a really wide variety of insects. 90% uh, of a young bird's diet is insects. And they also offer, you know, a lot of uh, high, high, valid, high quality foods, um, you know, aside from just the grasses. Uh, just here's a couple of different species that, you know, are native to Ontario that you would find in a prairie. We got colic root, dense blazing star, Riddell's goldenrod. Dense blazing star is actually a species at risk. A lot of prairie species are considered endangered just because of how rare they've become due to, uh, you know, just kind of the, how the habitats changed over the years. Um, it's best to think of tall grass prairie more of a, like a community of species. You know, like some areas you could have, you know, not every place, but you know, you'll have up to 200 different kinds of wildflowers that would be found amongst the grasses as well. And they really harbor a really big variety of uh, insect species and uh, a lot of different species at risk, uh, which we, which I'll call SARs. Um, and a lot of these species for tall, like in terms of tall grass prairie wildflowers are really only found in this region. Like they don't spread north. They're just kind of special to where we live. And again, it's a critical wildlife habitat in general. Um, native grasslands have, have, native grassland birds have declined in the past years by, uh, in the past 25 years or more consistently than any other bird group. 
Um, and again, those birds and those grassland dependent species are disappearing because of the loss of grasslands. Uh, you know, with projects that James was talking about and doing these restoration jobs, we're increasing this habitat. So, you know, there, there could be a shift at some point. And just some species that uh, are grassland dependent, bobolink, goldfinch. And just to get into, because we are really working with pollinator habitat tonight, that's kind of the focus. Um, you know, native wildflowers, you know, like generally when we do a prairie mix, because that's what we do, you know, we'll try to incorporate at least 15 to 20 species. So then you'll get blooms all the way from April all the way into October. Like essentially it's the asters that are in pollen right now, but those are all pollinating opportunities for insects all year round. And also I get to go take photos of these things sometimes too, so it's nice. There's monarch butterfly caterpillars. And you know, like you may think like, where can we put these things? Um, you know, a lot there's, you know, they, they can really be used for a lot of wise uses other than just putting grass down, just farmed drains and ditches. Um, prairie grass, when you put it along a ditch, it doesn't, you know, like, like the roots don't clog the ditch. Like, you know, a, a lot of managers are upset because people will put trees along ditches because they have to clean those ditches out. Those farm ditches are not natural. So prairie is a really good thing to put along those ditches. Um, just buffer and filter strips on people's properties um, to keep uh, to, to keep uh, nutrients on the on the soil, um, and just of course wildlife management projects, utility corridors, and I've got a really good project I can talk about uh, the utility corridors in just a few minutes. Uh, now, what we do is we're wildlife habitat specialists. Sure, it's a nice thing to say, but our goal is to achieve and maintain a healthy and sustainable environment by improving wildlife habitat and improving water quality. We do on the ground restoration work. And our main focus is tall grass prairie restoration. Um, we have custom seeding equipment to go in and do large scale projects. Uh, a lot of what we specialize in is doing buffer strips for farmers, but we've got the ability to go in and do 100 acre projects. Generally, most of our projects will end up being anywhere from an acre to about three acres on average. But we've got a, in the lower corner, we've got a no-till seed drill, which will allow you to essentially cut a very narrow strip and then lay the seed directly on the soil. And for other areas that uh, you know won't allow you to get in with a drill, we've got broadcast seeders. When these are all calibrated, so you know exactly how much seed is going on the ground. Um, one of the big challenges we had with our program, and you know, it's been really interesting for me just because I've been a technician since 2002, and you know, the program started in the 90s. Is I've really got to see the program grow. Uh, we'd initially start uh, myself and my other coworker, uh, Rob Buchanan, who's a, also a technician, we'd go out to provincial parks and we'd go get a handful of seed. We'd get, we, you know, we'd deal with the MNR and get all the permissions we needed. And we'd uh, go out and, you know, we'd spend our day going down a lot of times to Essex to just find some seed. But that's really changed because we probably do about 400 acres a year in plantings. So we needed to get a source for actual seeds. So we did. We, we would still collect seed in the wild and then we'd bring it into a greenhouse and grow it in a production setting. And then we would, we would create uh, seed beds of pure, of pure species so that we could manage them. And then, but our goal is to just, is to produce the seed, not actually the plants. So we'd harvest the seed in the fall, essentially is like uh, conventional farming. Um, except uh, everything I deal with is essentially on the uh, spray list. So uh, it, it's essentially organic farming when it comes down to it. We do use a bit for some invasive species, but it's, uh, it's quite a bit of work keeping these beds going. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, like as a technician that goes out and plants prairie, I really you know, like I'll often go to a landowner and, you know, plant their prairie and just kind of walk away. But in the last few years, I've really spent a lot of time trying to figure out what people are doing um, in terms of managing their plantings. 
So about the most important thing you can do is, you know, site preparation, because, you know, if, if, you, if you're in the, in, the, in the audience here and you, you've got a farm or you've got land that you'd like to do some work on, just think about what will grow the first year. And it's not the prairie. Prairie usually takes a little bit of time to grow. So generally, if we work with landowners, we'll get them to grow uh, Roundup Ready soybeans. And what that'll do is that'll actually eliminate the actual weed seeds that have been laying on the ground for years, because a lot of these seeds will lay on the ground, they'll get tilled up, they'll get worked up, they'll get sprayed. But a lot of these seeds will end up coming back up in your first year of the prairie. So site manage, site uh, preparation is probably the most important thing that we can stress to landowners. Um, plantings are slow to start. Um, essentially, I'll give you the keys back for your tractor and you'll think I took your money because nothing's growing. And it's quite common. Um, usually there's about two to three weeks where you will see nothing growing. And generally within the first year, you'll get some black eyed Susans, you'll get some grasses depending on your ground. But it's the second year that's important because all the all the wildflowers and things like that are just coming up in the second year, and you start getting your grasses growing up tall in the second year. Um, as and as James had said as well, you know a lot of the grasses stay low all through the season, and then they essentially make their jump in August September. So I'll get landowners. I've had this before. Well. I'll go back to their property in June of next year and I'll say, what happened? They said, nothing grew, so I planted beans. And, you know, unless you really educate people on what to expect with prairie, you know, like I, I not trying to scare people out of this, it's just, it takes a lot of maintenance in the first two years. Um, and you'll definitely need to mow it the first year and then get a early spring mow the next year. And just the biggest thing is, you know, be patient. I've seen some, prairies in uh, St. Clair Township where it actually took uh, three years for the grasses to really develop. And, you know, after three years, I've got some really happy landowners. And as James said, some people just like cutting grass too. So sometimes those guys are, can be my friends. Uh, I just want to take a few more minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions about establishment, I'd be thrilled to, to field your questions. Uh, but I just want to talk about some of our project highlights. Um, this is a wetland that, uh, well, I probably shouldn't use his name, but uh, he's in uh, West Lampton, uh, just outside of Sombra. We did a wetland and some prairie grass. Again, Highway 40, it's 38 kilometer stretch that I was thrilled to actually be a part of. Uh, I, was, I was part of the first plantings of it and the first year nothing grew but uh, thistle and teasel. And it was, uh, it was quite a sight, but after about two years, we went and mowed it, so it was managed, but uh, it, took, it took a couple of years, but you know, this is what it really looks like, the whole west side of the highway. And we do a lot of work with private industry. This is at Enbridge First Solar. I don't have the date on this one, but I believe this one was about 2017. Um, you know, a lot of these places have got setback distances. Um, for their plants and a lot of times they'll just allow farmers to farm them or they'll grow grass and have to mow the grass so we've made a lot of contacts and now they've got a you know a tall grass prairie there so it's helping wildlife instead of just being a, a, a maintenance issue. Uh, this is Lambton Lagoons uh, again uh, because of possible expansion they you know a lot of these municipal drainage areas and uh, settling areas will buy more land than they need so again this was all in soybean stubble in 2008 and here's a picture of it two years later uh, you know we've got uh, tall sunflower um, big blue stem as you can see and uh, you know a lot of black eyed Susan. you know there's a bit of golden there's a little bit of uh, um, wild carrot but that's something you know it's a biennial so it can actually be mowed out so it's really not an issue um, we also work with brawny creek provincial park um, we do a lot of work outside of lambton to cover the cost of our projects here and we've done over 280 acres there and uh, also the hydro corridor uh, and get and uh, this is just uh, outside of Scarborough this goes this is a corridor that runs directly through the city and I often talk about prescribed burning and things like that in my talks as well 
but uh, it, which, you know, Prairie does need, but with this project, because it's in town, you can't burn it. So what they do is they just mow it um, whenever it looks like it's a little overgrown. And, uh, you know, the, the input from the people that live there, um, you know, they're just thrilled with the project. So, you know, Prairie can be used in a lot of different settings. And even in your own backyard, uh, we do offer, uh, in the springtime, we often do plugs. Um, we don't really openly sell them, but, uh, you know, if we know some people, we can certainly provide a few. But, uh, you know, a lot of native species are beautiful and they're well adapted for here. Um, you'll notice a lot of the big grasses and things like that when you get those hot, hot droughts. All these prairie species are doing just fine because of the roots. And that's it for me. Thanks a lot. Really enjoyed that. Thank you for sharing with us tonight, Ian. Um, we recently put in some tall grass prairie at Lambton Heritage Museum um, in front of our one of our historic homes, the uh, Tedup House. Um, and it's in its first year, so I can uh, relate with what you're saying about it taking a, a bit of time to get established and get going. So I look forward to seeing it next year and, and what uh, what that will bring. It's been a that nice project for us at, at the museum and great to use part of our museum grounds towards um, with supporting our pollinators. So our final speaker tonight is Colleen Inglis, who is my colleague at the Lampton Heritage Museum. Colleen's our educational program coordinator. She received an honors bachelor of science from Queen's University, a master's of environmental studies from Dalhousie University, and a postgraduate diploma in museum management and curatorship from Fleming College. She worked as an ar assistant archivist at Lambton County Archives and as archivist at Fairbank Oil Field. And she's been in her current role at Lambton Heritage Museum for three years. And tonight, Colleen's gonna share some interesting artifacts from the museum collection with us. Thanks, Thanks for being with us, Colleen. Okay, so can you see my slides? Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, Dana. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and focus more on pollinators themselves uh, rather than pollinator habitat. Uh, so, so some pollinators uh, are viewed as pests. Um, and in Ontario, there are thousands of wild pollinators. Um, bees and flies do most of the heavy lifting, uh, but wasps, butterflies, moths, beetles, ants, and hummingbirds all do their part. And by transferring pollen from flower to flower and plant to plant, pollinators play an essential role in plant reproduction and in maintaining healthy ecosystems. And the interactions these species have with people uh, vary considerably. And I thought it would be interesting to investigate these relationships further by looking at objects in the Lambton Heritage Museum collection uh, that are associated with different pollinators. Uh, so a lot of pollinators we tend to view as pests. And I'll start with moths. Um, they're pesky because they create holes in uh, textiles and clothing. Um, eggs laid by a moth morph into larvae and the larvae feed on natural and synthetic fibers. And the hungry larvae cause the holes. And this can be a big problem for museums in particular. Uh, for example, the hat uh, in this photo uh, arrived at the museum in less than mint condition. All of the holes were caused by moths. And you can kind of get an idea of what the hat uh, would have looked like originally uh, by because it would it belonged to a member of a local marching band called the Thedford Silver Band. And you can see a photo of them here standing on the bleachers. Another example of uh, moths as pests um, comes from this uh, bottle of Sappho liquid and its matching cardboard box. So this is in our collection and uh, it's an insecticide designed for moths and bed bugs. And it's ominously marked the tour or the killer. And uh, it was made by a company uh, based in Montreal in 1911. And 
which was later taken over by the Kennedy Manufacturing Company. So this product itself uh, dates to about the 1920s or the 1930s. And this is an ad uh, for Safo products um, other, to kether, kill other insects and flies. And it was in the Canadian Farmer uh, way back in 1921. So we've been battling moths uh, for a long time despite their benefits as pollinators. Uh, Wasp stings, uh, they can be painful and dangerous to people, uh, but wasps are very beneficial as pollinators and they help to control other pests as well. Uh, wasps build their nests in various places um, and many of our heritage buildings at the Lambton Heritage Museum uh, meet their criteria for an ideal site. And this wasp nest was found uh, just this past September uh, up in the eaves of our Cameron Church. Perhaps the most annoying uh, pollinator pests are flies. And in 1935, the Alvinston Chemical Company began manufacturing these never dry fly coils. And they were designed and produced in Lambton County. And the company was owned by a chemist, Hans Meyer. And at its peak, the Alvinston Chemical Company had 20 to 30 employees. And, uh, Meyer's daughters remember uh, getting their hair caught up in the fly coils that their father hung around the house uh, while he was testing them. And what a fly coil does is it, it hangs from the ceiling and it can unwind in a long strip and then the flies get stuck when, it, when they get too close. And we actually use a modern version in our museum office space right now. Uh, another example with flies, um, comes from the Andrews Wireworks of Canada Limited. And they began in 1910, they opened a plant in Watford and the plant wasn't doing very well, uh, but it was actually saved by the pesky fly. Uh, flies are a nuisance to horses and cattle and uh, they bite them on the nose and the mouth and they cause discomfort and pain. And about 1914, um, the Andrews Wire Works decided that they could manufacture nose guards for horses. And the nose guards were made out of a fine wire mesh and uh, they were effective at deterring the flies. And they were a huge success. Um, they saved the plant. The sales uh, amounted to more than 500,000 of these horse nose guards every year. Um, and we have a number of them in our museum collection. And they declined, um, the demand for them dropped off um, as mechanization took over and farm machinery replaced horses. Uh, so the company diversified. Uh, their Androc line of products um, were like a various um, wire tools um, and accessories. And this fly swatter um, was a very common one. Um, we also have a couple pictures from uh, the Andrews Wireworks. Uh, the top is a photo of the entire staff uh, from about 1950. And below that, you can see some of the staff at work on, on the products made out of wire. And I find it really interesting that a lot of the products made, or the, a lot of the people who worked there were women um, when you look at this picture, which I find really interesting. Uh, so, Objects uh, are not just related to pollinators in terms of them being pests. Uh, they also provide uh, inspiration uh, for everyday objects and have been used both decoratively and symbolically in material culture objects. Um, this is a really cute little uh, honey pot from our museum collection and it's, it comes in the shape of a what's called a bee uh, skew, a bee skep. And it's like a beehive that's woven out of, uh, out of straw. And it's in that shape and you can even see the, the little hole there would be where you'd put the, the honey dipper. Unfortunately, we don't have the one that goes with this. Um, beetles also provide pollination services. And in this case, provided inspiration for a child's toy. And I think the owner of this toy would have been a really lucky kid. It's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool item. Um, it's a wind up beetle made out of sheet metal. Um, it's probably made out of tin. There's no maker's mark, but there are similar, similar beetles are made from the Lehman Company and they were based in Germany from about 1885 to 1900. And just to give you an idea of size, this particular beetle is about six inches long by three inches wide. So it, it's a sizable toy and, and definitely not life size. 
Um, butterflies are another type of pollinator. Uh, they have long, thin, coiled mouth parts, and this helps them get deep into, like, feed deep into flowers. And when they visit a flower, uh, pollen gets stuck on their legs and on their body. And, and when they drink and they move from flower to flower, they, they move the pollen around with them. But the colors and the shapes of butterflies, they've provided a lot of inspiration to people over the years uh, for artists and artisans. And this is a lovely piece uh, from our museum collection. It's uh, a folding paper fan. Unfortunately, there's very little provenance associated with this piece. We don't really know who it belonged to or when it dates from or anything like that. Um, but even so, I think it's a really beautiful example of using uh, butterflies in decoration. Uh, the blades of the fan are all natural wood and they're colorfully painted in a floral motif. The mount, which is like the paper part, um, it has, is kind of painted in an Asian style and on the opposite side of this fan, there's actually really blurry characters that are, are probably Asian in nature, but I, I can't read them, unfortunately. But I think it, it might explain uh, who made the fan. Uh, during my research, I, I found a lot of photos of folding fans and I found none that looked anything like this that had the butterflies with kind of the gold, almost wire antenna on them. Uh, these are a couple other examples of fans, not in our collection, but from other museums. And back in the 1700s and the 1800s, they were kind of like the accessory for fashionable women in Europe. Um, you wouldn't really want to be caught without one. Uh, they, fans, fans such as this originated in Japan uh, way back in 900 and to 960, so a long time ago and then they spread from there. Now, I was surprised to find that we don't have anything related to hummingbirds in our collection. Uh, in Canada, the rufous hummingbird and the ruby-throated hummingbird are both very important pollinators. Uh, like the butterfly, they have long tongues and they can, they can feed on really deep like trumpet or like bell-shaped flowers. Uh, they don't eat much pollen, but they transfer it when it gets on their bodies and they fly flower to flower. We also don't really have anything in our collection related to ants. Um, ants can be considered poor pollinators. Uh, their presence, not because they can't pollinate, but because ants being there tends to deter other pollinators that may be more effective, like bees. So there may be more of a cost benefit associated with ant pollination uh, than other pollinators. Bees are the most important uh, pollinators in Ontario. And as they go about their business, uh, they accomplish two things that are directly beneficial to people. Uh, they pollinate flowering plants that go on to produce food and they make honey, which is important as a sweetener. And their importance is reflected in the collection here at the Lambton Heritage Museum, which is particularly rich in objects related to bees or, or that can be connected at least loosely to to bees and the things that they do. Uh, so bees pollinate many species of native plants, um, but I wanted to look at apples um, because of their importance to people. Uh, for an apple blossom to become a fruit, fertilization has to take place. So pollen from the anther of the flower has to be transferred to the stigma. Some apples are self-fertile, so this can all happen in one flower. But other apples, uh, they need pollen to fertilize them from another flower or another tree entirely. And this is where pollinators are absolutely crucial. And when bees are moving from flower to flower, they're lured by the tasty nectar. They arrive, the pollen gets stuck all over them. They get stuck in their hairs and then they travel to the next flower and hopefully it lands on a receptive stigma. And about two to five bee colonies are required per hectare to pollinate an orchard. And orchards are generally planted so that uh, the trees are close enough together that the bees can easily travel from tree to tree uh, without getting distracted and, and flying off in another direction. 
The earliest orchard uh, that we know about in Lambton County dates to about 1808, and this was the LaForge Orchard, and it was located along the St. Clair River in what's now like the south part of Sarnia. Uh, a lot of the uh, early pioneers or early settlers to the area uh, planted an orchard because of all the useful products that they could get from the orchard to help help supplement their diet. Uh, this photo here, or this sketch here is from Belden's Historical Atlas of Lambton County, and it, it shows an actual farm, uh, the Luscombe Farm that was in Sarnia Township. The climate and soils of Lambton County are, are really good for growing fruit, um, apples in particular, and by the early 1900s, the industry was booming. Thousands of barrels of apples were shipped to Europe uh, out of the docks of Point Edward, and every single one of the apples in the barrel here would have been pollinated by a local pollinator. Uh, so if we look at a few more items connected to apples, uh, this is a photo from our collection of a woman picking apples. Um, you can see she's holding a basket, uh, which she would have used to collect the apples as she collects them off the tree. And then there's all kinds of bushel baskets full of apples already picked, lined up on the ground. Uh, the inset photo that looks kind of like a metal claw, uh, this is an apple picker, and it would have been on a long, on the end of a long pole. So you could hold it up and kind of gently uh, pick the apples off the tree and a few would collect in the basket and then you could lower it down to collect the apples. Uh, apples were picked or uh, apples were packed into barrels uh, to be shipped and you can, and these gentlemen here are packing barrels in forest. Uh, packing apple barrels was a very specialized job so you usually hire specific people to do it and the barrel lids were labeled uh, with the people who are packing it, the orchard they came from, uh, the location, the variety of apple, and even the grade of apple. And the stencils they would use on the lids of the barrel uh, were made of metal. And two examples here are for Ben Davis apples and King Pippin apples. And it's really interesting that uh, very few of those varieties are available today. Uh, as in, apples are extremely versatile, that's why a lot of early settlers planted them and this is they could be used for many things from making cider and apple vinegar to making apple butter and drying apples and this is an apple evaporator in Watford so it's it's a place where they uh, dried apples and made apple butter. These are a couple objects from the museum collection uh, on the left is a cider press and this photo was taken probably about 40 years ago, and it's of our press in action. Uh, you put the apples in the top or chopped up bits of apples in the top and you press it, press it down and then the liquid comes out the bottom. On the right hand side is an apple parer. It's like an apple peeler. Um, and they came in all shapes and sizes, even up to industrial models used by like restaurants. They, this particular one is called the Little Star. I really like the name and it's a lathe type pairer. And people would get together to pair apples because it was a big job and it wasn't very fun. And to make it a bit more fun, they'd have a pairing bee. And they would compete to see who could, you know, peel the apples the fastest and who had the best pairer. So that's why there's part of the reason why there's so many different varieties. So people benefit so much uh, from bees that uh, they kept their own hives instead of leaving the work of bees to chance. And a person who keeps bees, especially for like commercial purposes or agricultural purposes, they're called an apiarist. And bee farming in Ontario, it, it wasn't, it was very small scale until about 1880. And I really like the quote uh, here. It comes from the Canadian horticulturalist in 1916. And it says, a few colonies of bees are kept for the benefit of the orchard. They are providing a source of income from the honey besides the good work they do in the orchard. I often suspect that fruit growers do not always fully realize the important part that bees play in distributing the pollen. At all events, the increase of, bee, of, of bees has not been by any means kept pace with the increase in orchards. Growers whose orchards are not situated near an apiary would be well advised to keep a few colonies. 
I also really liked uh, this advertisement for beekeeping products. I think the, the, the name Beeware for uh, beekeeping products is just really cute. This is a uh, photograph of an apiary in Lambton County. Uh, this belong apiary belonged to David Smith and he's an immigrant from Scotland. He came here in the 1850s. He had this apiary on one of his farms. He was also a manager of a cheese factory. And this particular uh, apiary was located in what, in what is now Lambton Shores. And you can see all of the, the different beehives and probably his whole family looks like they're out there with him. If we move on a little bit, we can zoom in on the beekeeper and you can see that he's holding an object in his hand. And we actually have objects very similar to this in our collection. Um, it's a bee smoker. Uh, so you light, you light a fire in the bottom of the smoker. And when you want to, when the beekeeper wants to work on the hive, uh, he would spray the smoke in and around the beehive and that would help calm down the bees. So he could go about his work and not be attacked by a bunch of angry bees. And the, this, the smoker in kind of this form, it was event, invented by an American. Um, his last name was Quinby and it was invented in 1875. So I don't know, it looks, that kind of would date the photograph probably to after that at some point, because it does seem like it's a very similar object. And it, it, it looks like a castle almost with a side part to it, but the side part is the bellows and you kind of pump the bellows and that will help uh, generate the air to keep the fire going and keep the, keep the smoke going because you don't want the smoke to run out while you're working on the hive. And for the apiarist, the main product of the beehive is honey. And we have a number of these honey tins or honey pails in the museum collection. Um, they have, they're just a simple pail with a, a tight fitting lid and a bale handle. And they're really nice. They have good graphics. They're usually colorful. Uh, they became used about 1900. Uh, before that honey was sold and stored in, in big stoneware jugs. These tins could be reused and refilled, and they were often recycled as lunch pails. We had some in our schoolhouse at the museum that were used for that purpose. They're just a nice little size to keep your lunch in and they have a good handle to carry around. Uh, these particular honey pails are all from Lambton County. On the left, you have Monroe Honey, which is still in existence. And then you have uh, A.W. Campbell from Alvinston, uh, Bryce Jap from Brigden and Jay Gravel from the Grand Bend area. So all over the county is represented there really. And this last object uh, sent me on a bit of a wild goose chase. It's, it's a seal press. So when you stick a, a piece of paper between the jaws, uh, you get an embossed impression on a piece of paper and the embossed impression reads Klondike Hive number, uh, it's a little hard to read the number, and then it says KOTM Dashwood, Ontario. And Dashwood is just a bit north of Grand Bend. And in the middle, you've got a, a picture of a bee, a bee scout. And I thought this must have to do with an apiary. It must be a, a place for beekeeping north of the museum, but I couldn't find one. And the key was in the KOTM initials, which stands for Knights of the Maccabees. And this is a fraternal organization that was founded in London Ontario about in, 19, in 1878. So I think the hive number represents the particular branch at Dashwood. So it's more symbolic than having anything to actually do with beekeeping, which is kind of unfortunate because I thought it was, I was really excited thinking it might belong to an apiary in a beehive, but it's an interesting story. And um, I actually came across an archives in, I think it was Idaho. They found a trunk with a lot of items with the KOTM, the Knights of the Maccabees. And, and they had in that trunk, a similar stamp press. The image isn't exactly the same, but it's close and uh, it dated from about 1898 to 1910 so I would say the press in our collection is very similar and I just have one more slide uh, this last item from our collection uh, is a pressed glass plate and we have a large collection of pressed glass and this particular one has the bee scap 
on the front in the middle, and then it says be industrious. And I just thought this was really appropriate because that's kind of one of the things that pollinators do, not just bees, but pollinators in general, they're, they're just industrious and they, they go about doing their thing and they actually accomplish a great deal that benefits people and benefits the environment and the ecosystem in general. That's, that's all for me. Thank you, Colleen. And what an interesting um, variety of different artifacts in the museum collection that can relate back to, uh, back to pollinators. So thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> See any questions in the cat, the chat, or the Q and A? So I'm going to give everyone just a minute if uh, have any any questions for any of our speakers. And if not, I just want to thank everyone for um, for being here tonight and for taking taking the time to uh, come to our virtual talk. And I know there's a lot of options for uh, entertainment, so thank you for for choosing to be with us tonight. Um, and I will be sending out an email with a link to the recorded presentation. So if you want to watch it again or, or share it with anybody, um, that will be that will be available shortly. So if there uh, aren't any questions, I just want to thank our panelists for uh, being with us tonight. Really, uh, really appreciate everything you had to share with us, and uh, I learned so much. And um, have a have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. And thanks also, James and Ian, for, for participating. It was it was great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Really enjoyed it. Good night.